from you. I, I don't know. Yeah, you, you don't really feel that very often. Do you get that a lot? Uh, I think I do. I, I thought it was because I spend a lot of time in nature. And I, I have a very deep, profound connection with Mother Nature. And when I'm in the ice or when I'm in the forest or when I'm just barefooting, whatever I'm doing, I, I, I tend to bring her with me. And I thought that's what it was. But if I really go back in my life, people have always smiled at me on the street or waved hi. Complete strangers will just approach me and start talking to me. So uh, I'm not really sure, but I just go with it. So how how did you get into, can you share with me the timeline? I know that you weren't always into barefoot. I know that you always weren't into I guess, finding that connection. So where where did it, you know, where did you come from? Where did it go? <laughs> well, I started off with a major shoe fetish. Um, like uh, I, I worked in the corporate world for over 20 years and I loved shoes and I loved dressing up and I loved everything about that. Uh, and then I was downsized from my, uh, you know, career, which I thought was heading upward. I decided that I would just go for a really long walk. So I walked 780 kilometers or 500 miles across the north of Spain on a medieval pilgrimage route known as the Camino de Santiago. I went alone in the winter and I couldn't speak a word of English except maybe cerveza and gracias, <laughs> you know, are the two words I knew. I came back from that journey and realized that I had been missing nature in my life. I've, you know, when you spend you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours a day walking through fields or forests or, you know, vineyards, uh, it really opened my mind and opened my eyes to what uh, I was living. And I was living in Toronto in the city, you know, pretty much, you know, not downtown, but in, in the main part of the city. And I got home and realized that um, the noise was driving me crazy. I lasted another year or so. And then I moved up to my cottage, which is on the water, and then started a new life there. And that new life involved going to the forest a lot because there was a trail about a five minute drive from where I lived. And I went to this trail every second day, every third day, because I missed the Camino so much. Uh, that I, I started walking and, and there I connected with mother nature. It's the best way I can say is she started to um, download or give me information or give me, um, guide me would be the best way to put it. And the very first message she gave me was prepare to receive. Uh, and I didn't quite understand what that meant. I thought maybe I should open up a bank account. Maybe a lot of money was coming or something. <laughs> uh, but the next message was bring people back to the forest. And I walked away from that message thinking, how am I ever going to do that when I don't want to be a forest guide? I don't want to... I loved my personal time in the forest uh, and I didn't really want to bring a lot of people there. But uh, a few months later, I was sitting by the water and I had my, I think I had hiking boots on and, and socks. And for some reason, I just felt like I should take my boots and socks off and put my feet on the rock that I was on. So I did it. And as soon as I placed my feet on that rock, I got this kundalini surge of energy that went right from my feet through every chakra in my body and out my crown chakra. And I looked up uh, across the lake and thought, I get it. I'm supposed to be barefoot. She wants me to bring people back to nature, not necessarily the forest. It could be their backyard. It could be a patch of grass. It, it could be the beach, it could be anything but she was asking me to bring people to her so that she could offer them her wisdom, her healing, her nurturing, her love, her care. And that was just over 12 years ago, actually 12 and a half years ago. And I have made it my life purpose to bring people back to the forest. And that's how I started going barefoot. I didn't intend to ask you these kinds of questions, but I feel like 
feel like I kind of need to at this point. What some people call it Mother Nature, right? Some people call it God. Some people call it the universe, the infinite spirit. It, are, are, are we, they all talking about, do you feel like we're all talking about the same thing when you say Mother Nature? I believe we're all talking about the same thing, but I, I guess everybody has their own interpretation of what that is. Uh, I, I do know that uh, having been raised Roman Catholic, which I haven't been for many, 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 many years, I didn't like the fact that it was so patriarchal, that, you know, that God, Jesus, everything was male, was masculine. And I like the fact that Mother Nature, it, it's closer to me. I don't know if it's because I'm a woman that I feel I want that wanted that guidance from her or whether it's the divine energy that I'm connecting with. I, I think it is the divine energy. And so when she started to connect with me and actually drop these messages, into me because they don't show up as words or sounds or, you know, it's just all of a sudden, oh, bring people back to the forest. She's asking me to bring people back to the forest. How am I to do this? And then I would, you know, I would just listen and be really, really attentive to any kind of a message that, that I thought came from her. And, and then there was, when the message came, it was a knowing. It wasn't like I had to say, oh, is that her telling me what to do? No. It was just a knowing, oh, I got it. I feel like that's that's the way that these messages do come to us, though, right? It's And I, I explain it to my children because I was born and raised a Roman Catholic, too. Okay. Um, I, I feel like my faith has evolved in a way where now I see, I see where that piece fits in this whole kaleidoscope i guess of spirituality because i feel like we're all i feel like we really are all talking about the same thing um i think there was a period of time where we where we masculinized it right um but but there's a reason why we call her mother nature i, I think that that energy is kind of it, it's obviously a feminine energy right the earth energy and you know i i feel like the reason why i asked you that is because i feel like we all do talk about the same thing and I feel like whether you call that energy or that force God or, you know, spirit or the universe, capital U, whatever it is, um, I, I feel like it's that's what it is. Right. And, and I feel when I talk to my kids about spirituality and faith, I, I kind of show them where to look, but I don't show them what to see because it's extremely important for them to draw their own conclusions. My wife is uh, Presbyterian. Uh, we were married in a Presbyterian church. But my kids have been to Roman Catholic Church, Presbyterian Church, Lutheran Church, Evangelical Church. They go, and, and, and still the same, we're not, that's not the whole picture, right? That might be a slightly, slightly larger piece of the puzzle. But I don't think that, that it really, none of it really explains at all in, until you find what transcends that kind of labeling and that kind of pageantry, right? Because that's what Roman Catholicism really is. It's... It's how they dress it up. It's how they market it. Um, now, granted, you know, the Trinity and other defining characteristics of it, again, we're all talking about the same thing. So when I tell my kids that the perfect prayer is a prayer that doesn't, it doesn't contain words. It's, it's a communication with the energy. And you could say it in words if you can't think it otherwise. But it's, you, re, you know, it's, it's that pre-language thought that we have, I think, is where we try to go when we connect with the universe. I'll just, I'll say universe, mother nature, respectfully, same thing, right? And that's why when I get into nature and if anybody goes into nature, she is completely non-judgmental, non-judgmental. It is the one place where I can be absolutely 100% my authentic self with no fear of retribution or no fear of judgment or no fear of, you know, not fitting in or, you know, not doing the right thing. She allows me uh, or her energy allows me to have that, that freedom. And that is another reason, another thing that I learned from her. And when, you know, when you connect, really connect with nature, I think the wisdom that we can acquire is beyond anything that can be taught. It's not in books. It's something more profound than that 
And that makes it even more important for me to encourage people to return, return to the forest. Uh, and, and then she told me the next message she gave me, she obviously recognized that I was concerned about, okay, uh, if I bring them to the forest in their bare feet so that they connect with you, physically connect and have a sense you know, get the sensation of, of being one, you know, with the, with the universe or one with the, with the earth. What do I do then? Like, what, and I was worried. I, I didn't know what to do after I got them to the forest. And she, she told me, she said, no, don't worry. I'll look after them. Right. You just bring them to me and I'll look after them. I'll heal them. I'll nurture them. I'll give them love. I'll show them the birds and the insects and the reptiles and the animals i'll i'll get i'll i'll take care of that you just bring them to me do you think that do you think mother nature is limited to here on earth itself or do you, is mother nature everything beyond you know sun stars galaxies and things like that i, I believe it's everything at this, at this point my work is to focus on the earth just get people to connect with the earth and then she will guide them to whatever it is that that individual I don't know if it's needs or are ready for or I, I don't know what that is but I absolutely 100% trust that she will look after it from there so when I when I ice bathe when I go into the bath um or the ice water or the shower for me it's a way to kind of transcend words and thought right i go there to empty my mind and to have this non-destructive uncomfortable like external stimulus that is um that you know i just try to eliminate all that and, and find the peace and try that the, the pre-language place the pre-words place and, and that's my connection i think in a way to the universe at that time when you go into the ice bath, it might be slightly different. What do you, I know you, I know we, we do it for all of the great health reasons and for stress and for everything else, but like, where do you go when you go into the water? Yeah. Great question. Where I go is into oneness. So for me, it's, it's, it's so incredible to be you know, blanketed or closeted in this beautiful freezing cold water that, um, you know, once you go in the water, you know, for people that, that don't know necessarily all the things that happen, but one of the, one of the things that happen is our prefrontal cortex will shut down or at least, you know, slow down. And, and our prefrontal cortex is where we organize things and plan things. It's where creativity is. It's where, relationships are so when we're in the cold water there's no time to be thinking about those things our brain is so smart our reptilian brain says i've got to take over because this person might not know how to keep themselves alive in this freezing cold water and i'm talking about when it's really cold um and so for me i know now i can almost like just shut my prefrontal cortex down before anything happens. I just go in the water, I'm completely at peace. And then I'm experiencing oneness with everything. Uh, is, there, is there any thought or is that oneness, uh, I mean, when you say oneness, you're implying that you're, you're speaking the language of the universe around you, right? That, that you're connected, you're, you're fully immersed, you're fully involved. Does that oneness, transcend language you're not thinking word right no. no we're just being it's a state i i believe it's a state and it's a it's a state of of uh, full surrender and um acknowledgement and awareness like heightened heightened awareness uh most of the time you know i can go into that state but not every single time there are lots of um, situations where i get in the ice water and i'm playing with the ice and i'm you know swimming around i'm spinning right. around i'm dunking my head under i'm quite alert but the magical moments for me are the moments when i can just be absolutely 100 percent present and let go and and even to the point where i 
I can't feel anything. Like it's not about the skin or the muscles or the joints or the bones or anything. It's it's about the the full surrender to letting go and then just being in that state of oneness. And that's powerful. How did you get into the ice bathing? Were you introduced to it via Wim Hof? Was that just a happy coincidence that you're both kind of feeling the same thing at the same time and it's a serendipitous, you know, you just came across it. How did, how did you go from, you know, how did, how did you evolve into, into that? Well, it's kind of funny because I, when I started barefooting, of course, you know, it was, I think July or August and, you know, I would walk on gravel and I couldn't walk on gravel. And then, you know, slowly winter came because, you know, I live in Ontario in Canada and winter came and it got colder and colder. And I thought, oh dear, does this mean I have to go barefoot in the snow? And I was so committed to this, you know, this purpose of mine, this mission I was on that I did. I stayed barefoot as long as I could and went outside every single day, put my feet in the snow, tried to walk a little bit. And then over the years, I joined different Facebook groups and, um, you know, there were, there were people that were barefooters around the world and we would get together and talk and share stories. Well, there was um, this one barefooter in Germany and he kept reading about my stories about going barefoot in the snow and what I was experiencing and you know, how to avoid, um, you know, getting frostbite and things like that. And one day he wrote to me um, privately, like sent me a direct message and said, hey, Sue, um, I don't know if you know, but there's this Dutch guy who goes barefoot in the snow, just like you. And today I laugh at that because it'll be the first and only time that I will be compared to Wim Hof or sorry, that Wim Hof will be compared to me um, because, you know, he's 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 such a such a leader. But anyway, I looked up Wim Hof because he was barefooting in the snow, not because of the, the cold baths or anything else. And then, of course, I learned about what he was doing. I also had been uh, doing something called kniping, which is a form of hydrotherapy. And because I lived on the lake, the water was shallow um, at the beach. So I was able to go in freezing cold water, like just before it froze. And I would walk in the water, lift my foot out of the water, then drop it back down into the water, then lift the next foot out of the water and drop it back down. And this um, allowed the blood vessels to vasodilate and vasoconstrict and, and that sort of cleansed and flushed out uh, the cells. And it was really good for you. And um, this, this doctor, Dr. Knipe had like several different, I think he called them hydrotherapies. And so I had been doing this kniping. I'd been in cold water with my feet, but I never thought about putting my whole body in it until uh, I found out about Wim Hof. And as soon as I found out about him, I wanted to understand if the science that he had discovered or had been, um, you know, sort of awakened because of him had anything to do with the science of barefooting in the cold as well, or barefooting in different temperatures, because I needed research to convince people. They didn't want to, you know, they weren't interested in me telling them that mother nature wants to connect with them. <laughs> it wasn't working, you know? <laughs> and at that time, the only other thing I had was, was earthing. And of course, everybody thought, you know, earthing was just for hippies. Uh, so uh, it's slightly different today, but that's, that's where I was. In order to find out more about Wim and what he was doing, I decided to do the Polish, the, the Poland expedition, the five-day expedition. This was in 2017. And uh, so I, I, I went to Poland and I'll never forget the first day when I arrived, we were having dinner and um, one person said to me, oh, so did you see the Vice documentary? Is that why you're here? And I said, the Vice documentary? I don't even know what the Vice documentary is. And they said, well, you know what we're doing, right? And I said, no, not really. I just signed up because I wanted to find out, you know, what this is all about. And um, of course we climbed Mount Shnesna <laughs> in shorts and a tank top. So it was quite an experience. 
Did you have shoes on when you climbed it? I did, but funny story. I was in Greece before I, I went on the Polish expedition and I was on a waiting list because it was booked. And they called me in Greece to say that there was one spot available. So I didn't have any boots with me. I shopped all over where I was on, on the island of Crete and there were no boots on the island. So I bought, believe it or not, water shoes with extra thick, an extra thick Krebs sole. And I wouldn't recommend this to people, but what I did was I, I put a plastic bag on my foot and then a pair of socks and then another plastic bag and then the shoes. And I was able to climb Mount Shnezna in water shoes with plastic bags. <laughs> That is, and, and you climbed it with Wim Hof? He didn't go that time. I climbed it with all his, you know, senior instructors, um, but he didn't climb the mountain that day. I, I don't know exactly what happened, why he didn't climb, but he was there for the five days. It's just the actual climb he didn't do. How do you say, kniping? Yeah. Basically, cold water, air temperature, cold water, air temperature, creating, um, I guess, some sort of, you know, contraction and expansion, right? The vasodilation so and that helps with your lymphatic system, which doesn't have a pump. So, you know, that kind of helps move everything through. Do you still do that? Um, do you feel as though like ice bathing kind of handles that for you? Are there techniques that you do in the water that kind of um, do the same thing? Oh, uh, yeah, I still do it. I actually don't live on the lake anymore. I moved away a year ago but I'm really close to another lake and I go in the lake all the time. I, I, I love kniping um, because it's even like if there's snow, uh, I'm, you know, when it snows at Christmas, we had, I don't know, I think it was about three or four feet of snow dropped over four days and it was incredible. And I was like out there, like basically kniping in the snow uh, because it's such an incredible sensation to have freezing cold water on your calves and your feet alone, you know, without your without an uh, a full plunge. So yeah, I, I still do that. You, I, I saw videos of you walking around in bare feet um, in the snow, and I've heard you talk to some people about. You just have to kind of ignore that pain, right? Well, not ignore it, but realize that it just it's we're oversensitized. So these alarm bells are going to go off at, at the slightest level of discomfort because, you know, we're a quick fix society. If we're cold, it's easy, just get warm. You know, if you're hungry, it's easy, just eat. So, you know, we're not used to uncomfortable pains and hunger pangs to the degree that, that we're really designed to, to exist with. Um, how, like, but when you're walking in the snow, I feel like for me, it becomes painful now i'm pretty good at pushing things out of my mind and, and redefining pain but but there's certain physiological responses that are almost impossible to to amend um i i guess for the for the uninitiated or or the inexperienced so is it that for example i can go out in snow and and and, and fare more or less just as well as you do but the only difference would be that I'm just going to be more uncomfortable while that happens. No, no, you have to work up to it. There's no question. Um, if you start off going barefoot, even not in the snow, just barefoot, and you've been wearing shoes and socks for 20, 30, 40, 50, whatever, however many years you've been wearing them, your feet are now incredibly sensitive. Um, but sensitive in the way that is not necessarily good because any sensation that you feel, uh, you know, you have, there's, there's a doctor in the, there's a professor in the States called the Barefoot Professor and, and um, he presented this uh, research material that really changed my world. And basically what um, they had discovered is that we have between 100,000 and 200,000 sensory receptors and on the bottom or in each foot, okay? And those receptors um, send messages to the brain via neural pathways like other receptors in our body, interoceptors, extraceptors, and proprioceptors. So they send these messages to the body about the environment that we're in. 
and whether we're upright, whether it's slippery, whether it's and like everything about the environment is is being taken in through our feet, and then our brain, you know, acts as the maestro and says, "Okay, we've got to do this. We've got to move this muscle. We've got to send more blood to the feet if it's cold. We've got to add more fat to the ball of the foot and the heel of the foot so that um, you know it isn't as sensitive." And all all these things go on. Well, now imagine you're in shoes and your brain gets the message, it's hot and sweaty and flat in here. And that's it. It's hot and sweaty and flat. It's hot and sweaty and flat. It's hot. And so what happens then is like anything in our body, you know, if we don't use it, we lose it. And so these neuroreceptors are just like kind of wasted and the neural pathways are wasted. So they just shut down and stop working because they're not needed. And now the, our feet don't know how to warm themselves up because they've been kept warm. They don't know how to cool themselves off. They don't know how to uh, step on a really sharp rock and not have it hurt uh, because the, the, the feet are so sensitive to anything at all. They're hypersensitive actually. What happens when you start barefooting though, is the great news is, is those neural pathways can all be reset. And um, the neural receptors will wake up as soon as you give them an opportunity, they'll start to wake up and, and work for you. And uh, I learned this really quickly with gravel because as soon as you step on gravel from bare feet, it really hurts a lot. Um, and so what I started to do though with the gravel was I started to think about gravel as a sensation rather than pain, because really it was just a sensation that was being picked up by that neuroreceptor and, and sent as a message to the brain. So why would it be pain necessarily? First of all, the brain has to get the sensation and determine that it's dangerous or it's pain and then react to that. And that changed absolutely everything for me. When I teach people about barefooting, I say to them, try not to think of anything as pain. Just think about it as you are now uploading your brain with all these sensations so that it can learn how to adapt to each sensation so that you are not in pain, that you are safe, that you are healthy. Um, that is the goal of, of our brain and our whole body is to you know, get us through this life without being harmed um, in any way. And so over time, the same thing applies to the cold, but you have to do it slowly, one step at a time. Um, you know, don't go out in the snow and stand out there until it really, really hurts. <laughs> so there, I think, I don't think that it's possible to overstate that with the footwear and the minimalist footwear I mean, our feet do have just as many sensory receptors on the on the bottoms of our feet as we do on the palms of our hands. There's a reason for that. It's not meant to be wrapped in rubber and plastic and supported. Not not at all. And you, to your point, and I tell this to people because I wear I, I don't I don't go barefoot, but I wear minimalist footwear. I mean, I've only got you know three millimeters of rubber underneath. I wear zeros, um, and they're my favorite shoes. And they give me a lot of feedback from the ground, and perhaps that's an intermediary step before I go to complete barefoot. But imagine walking around and experiencing your normal day or week or month with mittens on, not gloves, but mittens on, and trying to make sense of what it is, the, the world around you. I mean, you can, you can feel a grain of sand between your fingers when you're rolling them. Right. And you should be able to feel that same grain of sand underneath your foot, not in a painful way, but in a, in a proprioceptive way. Right. And, and this is your an external environment kind of way. And we're we're anesthetizing those nerves, which aren't just for sensory perception for what's on the ground. But but it informs the rest of our body kind of how to hold its posture and how to move dynamically through the environment. And it's it's similar to just numbing the bottom of your you've got so much valuable information. So, you know, when we talk about the kinetic chain, we, we usually say that it's rotten from the ground up. It starts at the feet, it moves up the ankle and then to the knee and to the hip. And now you've got all these structural compensations happening. No wonder you've got crappy posture. No wonder you've got this because you you're walking around with 
an inch and a half of rubber underneath your feet. You've completely turned off all of the feedback you're going to get from that, that particular area. And, and now this whole slew of problems ends up resulting as, you know, from that. And we, we look or orthotics, the worst thing you could do for yourself, orthotics, right? You've got, you, you don't have an arch in your foot. So we're going to force an arch in your foot, but, my my all three of my kids all have wicked arches in their foot because they run around barefoot all day and we and we recommend that uh it's it's insane how dumb i think we play sometimes when it comes to our health and you know we're hoping that we can rely on naturally you know some more of a quick fix than than putting in some of the effort yeah and and you know what you're doing, like even wearing minimalist shoes, it's important for your posture and your alignment and stacking, you know, stacking your knees on your ankles, your hips on your knees, your shoulders on your hips, like, you know, you're stacked and you're at least now working, um, you know, in a, in a stacked manner, which is going to help you uh, in many different ways. The next level to that when you actually take off the shoes and start to experience your world with all of these sensory receptors. I mean, I'm, I, I can't even be bothered putting shoes on anymore because I, I, I miss out on so much. In fact, yesterday I was looking after my mom. I, I go visit my mom every Monday and Tuesday. She's 90, almost 91. She's completely blind now for the last year she's been blind. And um, before that, like probably five, six years ago, I got her going barefoot in her apartment. And she, she told me again yesterday when she was, we set up a, a series of mats or carpet that lead from her couch to the bathroom so she can find her way to the bathroom. And the way that she finds her way is her feet feel the sensation of the carpet. And she knows as soon as she feels the tile floor, she's not on the path to the bathroom and therefore she's going to get lost. So she feels her way to the bathroom by using her feet. And yesterday, again, she told me this before and yesterday she said it again. She said, you know, the problem is when I put my shoes on, I don't know where I am. And I said, mom, that's it. That can you imagine all the people in the world who are walking around right now and they don't know where they are? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's that simple. We don't know where we are if we don't have our feet exposed. The body has no idea, zero idea. It's it's flying blind essentially, right? Yeah. That said, I still, you know, I still think there's a time for shoes. And you know, like I like I said, I used to have a shoe fetish. I, I don't anymore, but um, there's a time for shoes and yeah, there's a time for style. If you want to look good, if you want to feel good, you know, go for it. But at the same time, take some time out of your life to even experience uh, this sensation. It just, if you think about when you go to the beach, how everybody at the beach, almost everyone is barefoot and everyone is smiling. Everyone feels fantastic at the beach. Well, when I go out in the snow in, in my bathing suit, <laughs> it's exactly the same feeling. It's like I'm at the beach, especially if I'm down at the water. It's like, oh, look at I'm at the beach. And I start running to the ice because the sensation is the other extreme. You know, we have the hot extreme and the cold extreme is just another extreme but I'm barefoot and in my bathing suit. So it feels really good. And I'm not crazy. <laughs> Talk to me about how walking barefoot and being grounded reduces inflammation. Cause I find this incredibly interesting. Yeah. So this is the research that was done on earthing or grounding as we know it. And it's this idea that the ground is negatively charged. And when I talk about the ground, you, you have to be on uh, rock, earth, you can be on grass, um, live water, so a river, a lake, a pond, anything like that. Uh, so there is a negative charge there. And our bodies are bioelectrical. So we work on a positive and a negative charge. It's really simple. 
the thing is that we have lots of opportunity for positive free radicals in our body to, to generate. We don't have as many opportunities for negative ions to offset the positive free radical, positive charge, negative charge. Um, and the reason we don't is because we don't sleep on the ground anymore like we used to. Um, and we're designed to be connected to the ground so that we can offset these um, positive free radicals. By going barefoot, even if you just go outside, and now, you know, what I've read recently is they're saying 20 minutes is kind of the optimal period of time that you should ground. So you need, if you go outside, put your feet on the ground, even if you're sitting around your, you know, uh, a patio table, you're sitting around on a chair, take your shoes and socks off and put your feet on the ground. But better yet, go for a walk or walk around your backyard or wherever it is that you are. And that alone will help to reduce inflammation. It also helps with um, sleeping. Um, it helps with um, circulation and inflammation. And it's simple. It's so simple and it's free. Do you have any orthopedic problems, any back problems, hip problems, knee problems, foot problems? Well, most of my life, since I had three babies, and when I had, when I was pregnant with my second daughter, um, I had really a serious problem with my left hip, um, where the the ball was extreme. You are extra flexible when you're when you're pregnant for obvious mm -hmm. reasons. You have to be, but the ball in the hip joint kept like moving it felt like it was going to pop out and I, you know I went I had a GP um well I guess I had an obstetrician as well but anyway I told one of them I can't remember which one and basically they just said oh it's because you're extra flexible but ever since that pregnancy my hip has never been the same um in what else I don't know I used to have I used to stand and one foot was always in, in front of the other. And I still have that a little bit. Sometimes it comes up, but then it straightens out again. So what I found with barefooting, oh, and my feet were flat. That was definitely, I thought my feet went flat because I had three babies. I thought it was all the weight that flattened my feet. <laughs> and I don't think I'm the only woman that thought that. Uh, but in fact, my feet went flat because I was wearing shoes and not using all of the muscles and ligaments and tendons and bones in my feet. Uh, so they just got lazy and fell down. Once I started barefooting, my arch came back and I have a really high arch I had when I was younger. And my arch went right back to what it was like when I was 20 years old. I would wonder, and I'm, I'm not wishing this on you, I think it's an interesting thought experiment at least, if you were to wear a pair of shoes or sneakers for a week and journal what your body feels as a result of that and and, and almost you know because i think that what you'll probably find and you'll agree is that things are going to hurt things are going to hurt bad your posture is going to change you're going to slouch because you're always in pain and if you wear them for long enough starting from we'll say an adult zero um where this timeline begins now, you could probably begin to journal and document a precipitous decline in your physical, if not biological performance, if you were to start doing that now. It, it's right? interesting you said that because a couple of weeks ago, I was in my, my favorite secondhand store and I saw a pair of heels and I thought, oh, they look like my size. And I bought them. They were $7. <laughs> And I bought them with the intention of trying to wear them for one day, not even a week, one day. And I thought, well, I'll document it. You know, I'll just do videos every hour and talk about how I'm feeling. Well, I put the shoes on and I couldn't last five minutes. <laughs> I don't even know how I used to walk in heels or how women walk in pointy heels with their you know, feet all squished in and angled up. My back was sore. My hip was so, hips were sore. My knees were everything was sore. I, I I couldn't do it. But maybe I'll try just regular shoes, <laughs> and maybe do it for a little bit longer. And yeah, and uh, record the experience. That would be so interesting. I I want to go back and talk a little bit more about ice bathing. 
and and addiction and depression because I know a lot of people utilize ice bathing and, and contrast bathing to to help them in their recovery and to help them kind of stay free from the shackles of depression and from addiction, which often go hand in hand. Um, I, I hope you don't mind the question. Do you have any experience with addiction or depression? Um, and, or can you talk to some of the points and, and perhaps some of the biology of ice bathing and, and how it changes, I guess, our perception and, and the way that we, we manage stress, anxiety, fear, and depression. Yeah, so I don't have any experience with addiction, um, but I did grow up with an alcoholic father, so I just always lived my entire life very careful about becoming addicted to anything, except something like an ice bath, <laughs> which I'm totally <laughs> addicted to. Uh, and depression, yeah, I mean, over the years, absolutely, I've had my fair share. Uh, what what was interesting was during the pandemic, uh, with all of the isolation, I experienced more depression than, than any other time in my life. Uh, but I did do ice baths as many days as I could, as often as I could, like just about, not, not anything like Joe, um, 400 days, but I did 65 days in a row. And then <laughs> I still stopped. great. I know. Yeah, I can't break that record. Uh, I did 65 days in a row and then I took a day off because I couldn't see the water. There was like this kind of fog. It was a winter storm. It was so bad. I couldn't make my way down to the ice wall. Couldn't see. Uh, but yeah, so what happens with a, with a cold, cold therapy or an ice bath is it's really quite amazing that we are given the opportunity to kind of practice um, using our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So the idea is that, you know, we can either use it with our breath, with the, you know, I'm a, I'm a Wim Hof method instructor, so I'm obviously gonna talk about that te technique, that method. Um, but with the breath, we, we use our breath to, um, uh, to access the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. And with the ice bath, you know, we do the same thing. We, we get into that freezing cold water and allow all of the triggers that would happen to us when we're in a, an extremely dangerous situation, possibly even life-threatening. Uh, and, and certainly if the water is, you know, close to zero, uh, Celsius, I'm talking about, you know, that's, that, that is absolutely life-threatening for our, for our body. And what we do is we, um, command the breath. So control the breath and, and try to remain calm. And, and it's almost like being an observer of yourself experiencing this fight or flight, um, opportunity. It's like watching yourself go through it and allowing the brain and the body to release uh, endorphins, to release um, noradrenaline, uh, norepinephrine, um, which is going to like change the physiology of the entire body and brain. And it allows us, you know, I, I kind of like to refer to it as um, like a restart, like with your, with your phone, you know, when your phone freezes, and the only way that you can get it unfrozen is if you power it off and then power it back up again. When you power it back up again, you have all your pictures, all your texts, all your messages, your WhatsApp, everything is there. It's just now moving really fast. Uh, it's kind of like that. We're practicing going into fight or flight, absolutely accessing what that uh, sympathetic nervous system would do if we were, you know, if we were in a very, very serious survival state and then coming back and going into a really gentle, a rest and digest normal state. Um, and it's, it's through that, that we gain the ability, or at least, you know, for me, one of the greatest benefits is this ability to, to find absolutely, absolute clarity like this level of clarity that 
I don't even think I've ever experienced in my whole life um, because my whole um, you know, system, my whole central nervous system has been has been worked. It wants to save me. It wants to, it wants to be my friend. And, and that's what it does. Do you, uh, so you're a Wim Hof instructor. You, you coach people through this. You've seen many people do it for their first time. Oh yeah. And I think that there's a lot of people out there that are, it's catching more and more people's interest and more and more people are interested in doing it. It's just that, that fear of jumping, right? That initial first step that everybody is always so nervous about, right? Everybody's so relaxed, probably over relaxed before, like before we pull back the curtain and you show them the ice bath that they're about to get in. And then there's probably a level of anxiety. And then that builds until they get in, they get out and they feel such a bunch of relief. What, I mean, what are some of these what are some of the thoughts that they all seem to share? We're talking like new ice bathers who perhaps maybe had a friend drag them to this thing. Um, how how do you get them summarily? How do you get them to to kind of bridge that and to to dispel the stress that they've got leading up to the moment they get in? I think the most important thing is to prepare them for what is about to happen. And the best way to prepare somebody is to give them some knowledge, some background. Here's what's going to happen. This is how your brain is going to react when you're in the ice water. And this is how your body is going to react. And this is why your blood vessels are going to vasoconstrict. And this is why your hands are going to hurt like hell. And so are your feet. It, they're going to be cold. So everybody gets out of the ice bath and says, my hands and my feet are cold. Everybody, like almost everybody. And so it's really just helping them to understand how, how the brain is going to respond to that, you know, how your nervous system is going to respond to that, how great it is when, you know, when you release dopamine in, into, into your body, that you can actually get that beautiful, what's, I call it the dopamine high, you know, just by getting in some water for, and it can be as little as 90 seconds to get all of the benefits. So I think what's important is to educate people. And that's why I like the Wim Hof method because when I do a fundamentals workshop, then we go through all of the science and we set it all up and we go through safety. I'm really, really big on safety. We, you know, we have a buddy system. We, you know, and I make sure that the buddy is making sure that the other person is coming out of the water and they're okay. What's happening now, and I see it all over, um, you know, some of my students have started communities of people going ice bathing and um, it's, you know, I think it's great. I just worry sometimes about the amount of safety that is covered and if people really understand, you know, what, what could happen. And that there is, you know, a, obviously a very serious situation if you have, you know, um, heart disease or um, uh, even like high blood pressure and you know, or if you're pregnant, you can't do it. So I think it's just, yeah, educating. It is still relatively new, right? And and it's catching fire. And naturally what you're going to have is people that kind of splinter off. And I'm sure that we've seen that already. I'm not sure exactly how, but I'm sure that there's, you know, maybe a Jim Hoff out there that's doing ice bathing. And, you know, everybody's going to kind of start putting their own spin on it because the Wim Hof thing perhaps is, has become saturated, right? And And rather than subscribe to that people are going to put their own spin on it and then what ends up happening is that something unfortunate happens and that and that it's going to cast the light on the entire movement if you will that's backed by science it's backed by study it's backed by all these things but the headlines don't care and and now we've got a real problem on our hands because people like you and and so many others that are out there trying to do it for the right reasons could very well become villainized for promoting such an unsafe practice when it really hasn't been a problem forever until irresponsible people kind of got their hands on the attention. Um, how, how do we avoid that? I know that education is the answer, but, and I also know that certification is also perhaps the answer, you know, well, so-and-so that did it wasn't, you know, certified in X, Y, or Z. Um, are there, I mean, what are some ways that, we can ensure that you know the message continues to try to stay as sacrosanct as it as it could. 
Well, I mean, there's a there's a, a PhD uh, a student, I, or maybe she, I don't know what how to refer to her. I guess she's a doctor, in fact. Um, and um, uh, now I've forgotten her name, Suzanne uh, Soberg, Suzanne Soberg. And she's just released some research that she did on cold um, therapy. And it's really quite good because what she's determined is you don't have to go into an ice bath. So, you know, there are like an ice bath is extreme. It's an extreme situation. You need to be with somebody who knows what they're doing. But if you're having cold showers or if you're just getting into a cold bath, you know, you, you can do that with, you know, with a little bit of understanding about what might be happening in your body and you can get a lot of benefits from it. And this is what, you know, she's just released this book called um, Winter Swimming, which is um, outlines a lot of her science. I have the book on order, but it won't, it isn't released until I think January 24th. So I'll, I'll read it then, but I've been following her and I'm, I'm happy that she's now addressing that other group of people that, you know, want to have a benefit, um, but they don't necessarily want to know all the science, or maybe they don't necessarily want to do an actual ice bath uh, or anything under, you know, 10 degrees Celsius. Um, maybe they just want to do cold showers. And there are lots of benefits in just doing a cold shower, you know, especially um, as it relates to, you know, lifestyle diseases, you know, overweight or, you know, mental illness or pain, um, you know, there are ways of dealing with that. So I think it's a, it's a really big market out there. There's a lot of people and they need a lot of help. So there's the people that want to do Wim Hof and want to really understand a, a technique of breathing that, you know, can impact your immune system and, uh, strengthen your mitochondria. I mean, I'm all all about strengthening my mitochondria, but not everybody is. Uh, and um, so maybe you know maybe we can just figure out you know how to how to break up this market and help everybody. I think that's a great point. Um, again, I, I I know many of the people that I know that ice bathe, myself included. Um, I I like to categorize similarly to to running. So I do a lot of running. I'm an endurance athlete. And we say that we're either running from something or we're running to something. And I, f I feel like it's the same thing for people trying to really take what is like a primary interest, which is the, the psychological benefit, because people are trying to run from something. I think we all are in some way. Um, and, and running from something, naturally we're running to something. We just hope that it's not drugs or it's not abuse or anything of that nature. It's more something therapeutic, ice bathing, breath work. Um, exercise, you know, all of the things. Now, one thing that I've not tried to reconcile, but I guess pops up right now is we know that, you know, the benefits in ice bathing, we can put that in a bucket. And then, you know, the breath work, different types of breath work, we'll say the Wim Hof style breath work specifically, we'll put in, in a separate bucket. But it almost seems to me that there is a certain marriage between the two. And, and Wim Hof does a good job of, of explaining that and, and making that connection. I'm unclear as to what that, what that symbiosis, if not synergy, is between breathing and ice bathing. Can you help connect those two dots for me? Uh, wow, what the synergy is. Well, the research shows that if you do the breath work, you get X number of, you know, um, results and then if you do the ice bath you get the other results and then if you do it together then everything is amplified uh, the thing with the breathing is the the method of the breathing is so powerful because if you're just starting to feel like something's coming on that you're about to get sick and you can do the breathing and actually increase the ph level so that your body's more alkaline and that way you're in a better state for healing um, you can also, uh, reduce your, um, or increase your pain threshold. So you don't, what would normally be really painful doesn't feel pain as painful. And that's why it's nice to do the Wim Hof breathing before an ice bath, <laughs> because, you know, you don't feel the, the cold of the ice. Uh, and, um, 
what's the third one I'm thinking of? Uh, your immune system is, is improved. And so when you have results like that, I, I keep telling people, especially friends and family, I, you know, like just do the breathing. You know, if you don't want to get in the cold, just do the breathing at least. And you're going to be, you're going to be able to handle things in your life, whether it's emotional or, you know, mental illness or physical illness there, um, you know, the results of uh, the benefits of the breath work are, you know, translated to both mental and physical. And it's the same with the ice bath. What you're doing is you're actually working on your mental capability and at the same time doing something physical. So you're training your brain to adapt, um, which is probably our biggest advantage is that we can adapt to different situations. And so we're, we're training that. And then when you put the two together, it's like a magic formula, but it, it's not, you know, it's a magic pill, uh, formula, but it doesn't work for absolutely everything, obviously. It, it can't. Uh, but there's research now, they're talking about um, the method actually reducing the size of, of cancerous tumors. I mean, that's pretty profound. So when do you do the breath work? Do you do your 30 deep breaths, hold, breathe out, and then get in the ice bath? Do you interrupt the breathing with the ice bath? When are oh, you supposed to time that? No, no, no. The breath work is one thing, and the ice bath is completely separate. So you do your rounds of breathing. You do your breath work, always laying down or sitting down. You never do it near water. You could pass out. You never do it near water or if you're driving, anything like that. It's very important that you're doing the breathing, laying down or sitting up um, and not doing anything else. Uh, you can, the, the um, effects of your pain threshold being higher lasts approximately six hours. So if you do the Wim Hof me method breathing and then within the next six hours do your ice bath, you will feel less of the, the uh, quote pain sensation of the cold. Uh, yeah. Uh, so it's pretty, you know, it's pretty good for me. I, I, it doesn't matter when I do my breathing or when I do my ice bath. Now I, I don't even time them together because for me, uh, I don't treat the cold as something painful. Um, I'm so beyond that. I'm apparently I'm what you call cold habituated. Uh, Mike Tippin, who is a professor in the UK, um, met me. I, I did a the doctor's show. I don't know. It was a show on TV, and um, it was during the pandemic. And so they zoomed me in from like coaching in an ice bath. And uh, this guy, Mike Tipton, who's really well known, he said to me, "Sue's obviously cold habituated. It, it doesn't. The cold doesn't affect me for a, a pretty long time. Uh, but that's not necessarily the way for everyone." Right. Right. You know, for the breath work, I've got a son. He's nine years old. Um, he's got two sisters. Maybe that's part of his problem. <laughs> but he, uh, he's got a high level of, of anxiety. Now, fortunately, he's healthy in all regard. But, um, you know, he gets overwhelmed sometimes, especially before bed. He feels pressure. I think a lot of kids do feel pressure just before going to sleep. Like, now I've got to go to sleep. And they're just not ready for it, which explains why my four-year-old will go from 100 miles an hour to falling asleep mid-stride because she's trying to get every last drop out of this thing, right? So the other night, a couple of weeks ago, and they know that I that I do the the breath work. They know and different kinds of breath work um, and and ice bathing. You know, we it, it's almost a family thing now. We just have to get my oldest daughter into it. Uh, but my four year old, my four year old loves it. She doesn't, you don't have to turn the hot water on. She just goes right in the cold bath. She goes in when there's ice. It, uh, she, it's incredible. But with my son, the other night, I, I try, I said, why don't, why don't we try some breath work? And, and we did, I guess, what you would call the modified Wim Hof um, session where, you know, he was laying down in bed. I know for me, 30 deep breaths is enough to make me feel fuzzy. Uh, mm -hmm. But I didn't, I didn't want to subject his little body to that, right? So we started with 10 deep breaths, a hold, then he breathed out, and then we cycled again, and we cycled two or three times, and was actually able to get him to, to, to visualize on the inside of his eyelid what he described as being extremely vivid um, 
you know, visualization in a way. So for me, I felt like that was a success because now I can get the kid to close his eyes and watch something while he falls asleep. Uh, is there, are there any formal guidelines when it comes to children and breath work? Because I feel like it's a solution for, for some things for adolescents as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think our limit is age 14 uh, with parental, um, a, you know, sign off. Um, but I know of um, many instructors who have their kids doing it. And even Wim, uh, the last time I saw him was in Holland at the instructor's reunion. And he was talking about um, two young, um, I think they were eight and 10 or somewhere around that age. I know one of them was eight years old and they were siblings and they both had cancer. Wim, Wim taught them the breath work and I believe they did cold plunges as well. And they are now in remission with their cancer. Uh, so, I mean, he's working with many, uh, many, many different scenarios uh, to try and understand how, how it impacts younger people. But but there are different versions of breath work. I mean, breath work for kids, you know, can be anything from just like box breathing, just teaching them to follow their breath and even know that like the even adults, like teaching them to follow their breath and think about breathing and think about expanding their lung capacity. I mean, that's enough. It, it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be, you know, Wim Hof method breathing necessarily at that age. It's just teaching them to, you know, I've been doing breath work since I was 25 because I, I got asthma at the age of 25 and all they did was give me puffers and you know, tell me not to do anything. And I just decided that that wasn't going to work for me. I, so what I did was I developed my whole lower lung capacity, knowing nothing at that time about uh, the, my diaphragm and diaphragmatic breathing. But I just, I just developed it because all the asthma was in the upper part of my lungs. And um, yeah, so I've done all kinds of, of, of different types of, of breath work and training around breath work. So yeah, like, you know, try some other things, even, you know, breathe in for one and out for three, like a long exhale will slow the heart down. So even if you're, you know, your son does a long exhale, he's going to, he's going to feel more relaxed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I ask all my guests this, <clears throat> and I think it'd be really interesting answer from you what does it mean to you to be human ah to be human well i think the key word in there is to be human not do what humans do um but actually for me to be human is to get out of the way and let my body and my brain and let mother nature and let 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 life unfold let my body heal me. Let my brain figure out what needs to be done. And for me to get out of the way and not be interrupting that beautiful flow. We're designed to be healthy. We're designed to, to be safe. Our feet, the skin on the soles of our feet is designed to protect us. It's not like any other skin on our body. It has the ability to turn into snow tires. You know, if the ground is slippery, I can run across wet rocks in my bare feet. If I was wearing shoes, I wouldn't do it because I'd probably fall. So for me, that's a perfect example of how I'm allowing my body to take me on my journey. And at the same time, you know, I'm fully aware and fully engaged. You know, when I say I, I get out of the way, I just mean that you know, I, I don't put socks on my feet when they're cold. I let my feet figure out how to warm themselves up because I know that they know how to do it. So basically, for me, being human is allowing myself to rewild back to the point where, you know, my body starts to really look after itself. And then I just get involved when it's absolutely necessary. So I saw that uh, I think you were holding up a rewild T-shirt. In one of your images, and I thought to myself, "That's the coolest T-shirt that I've ever seen." Where can I get a rewild yourself T-shirt? You know what? It's actually a cushion. 
And it was a friend of mine. She invited me to this entrepreneurial event that they had. And because she had, she asked me to record a, a video for them to talk about how um, cold therapy and barefooting could help them be more creative, entrepreneurs be more creative. And as a gift for doing that little video for them, she gave me a cushion that said, rewild yourself. But it's, but I've been thinking about doing t-shirts. Yeah, that say rewild yourself. So you know what, maybe I'll get on it. You've got great ideas that are completely aligned with me. I'll get on it and I'll definitely send you one. Oh God, that would be, because I, I, I need one. I absolutely yeah. need one. I think yeah. that's incredible. Um, now, where can people find you? I know they can find you everywhere, but specifically, where can they find you? Yeah, well, I kind of went wild on TikTok during the pandemic. So um, I'm basically Barefoot Sue just about everywhere now. Uh, but if you look on Linktree, if that's the easiest one, linktree.com slash Barefoot Sue, you'll find um, all my Facebook, Insta, all my links are, are there. Awesome. Well, Sue, it's really been such a pleasure to have you on. I can't thank you enough for your time. I thought it was a long shot actually reaching out to you and you jumped right on it. And I, that, I you, my wife was next to me when you had said, you know, that you'll do it. I was like, this is the most exciting moment for me right now. This is so cool. So um, thank uh, you. Thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you for all that you're doing to really help people on their journey in life. I'm so inspired by all of your, well, I haven't seen all of them, but I watched a, a bunch of your, I listened to your podcast. Actually, I, I, I listened to two of them before I went to bed the night before last and last night. So um, I've really enjoyed uh, enjoyed your conversation. So thank you for having me on and thank you for sharing more in the world about barefooting. You're helping me with my mission and with what um, the great mother nature has asked me to do. So I, I really appreciate that. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.